Life for early Homo sapiens was brutal, but their biggest threat wasn't wild animals, it was other humans. The Neanderthal predation theory suggests that our own cousins once hunted us, and maybe even ate us. How did we survive? And what does it say about who we are today? It may sound insane, but the Neanderthal predation hypothesis is a widely debated idea that claims the extinction of Neanderthals was not because of climate change, disease, or even passive competition, but rather the result of direct and often very violent encounters with our ancestors, the Homo sapiens. Now, in order for this situation to make sense, you have to understand that the evolutionary timeline of humans is anything if not complicated. In other words, it is complicated enough that Homo sapiens lived with not only Neanderthals and Denisovans, but very likely lived around very archaic species like Homo erectus and very recent species like Homo floresiensis. It's even very possible that we lived with Homo heidelbergensis, although they most likely went extinct before Homo sapiens even appeared. Essentially, what I'm trying to show you here is that, to a degree, early humans of different species all called the world home at the same time. It was more or less a web of overlapping species and not a straight line. So how does that feed into the predation theory? Well, the hypothesis proposes that early modern humans either outcompeted Neanderthals through superior intelligence, social cooperation, and advanced tools, or, in a very gruesome and bizarre twist, directly hunted them down to extinction. Now, before you outrightly dismiss this very concerning idea, you have to first note that the hypothesis actually draws from the archaeological overlap between the two species, particularly in Europe and the Near East, where they coexisted for not hundreds, but thousands of years. Okay, so they lived together. That doesn't suggest they hunted each other, right? Well, evidence such as cut marks on Neanderthal bones and questionable abrupt shifts in their population tells a different story. See, this evidence suggests some kind of conflict between the two species, although at the moment, not conclusively. What we do know is that this perspective challenges the more traditional image of gradual environmental decline and that of peaceful integration through interbreeding. It instead places Homo sapiens in the role of a territorial aggressor that actively wiped out a competing hominin species. Now, with how insane this idea is, it's easy to think it can't get any more insane, and you would be dead wrong. See, shocking the world, in 2009, Australian researcher Danny Vendramini took this concept even further with his radical reinterpretation in the book Them and Us, How Neanderthal Predation Created Modern Humans. Now, by the title, you would think he was alluding to how they shaped our social interactions and, at the very least, hunting techniques, if you consider the predation theory. But that wasn't what he did. Vendramini, in an even more controversial take, introduced his own model, the Neanderthal predation theory. Vendramini's idea flipped the script as he argued that it was Neanderthals, not Homo sapiens, who were the original predators. According to Vendramini, Neanderthals weren't the gentle, intelligent cousins often portrayed in modern paleoanthropology. Instead, he claimed they were apex predators, and at the very least, savage, powerful, and specialized in ambush hunting, which also included the hunting of early humans. Based on his view, Neanderthals absolutely terrorized the early Homo sapiens population in the Levant around 100,000 to 45,000 years ago by conducting deadly raids, engaging in cannibalism, and even committing sexual violence. For context, the Levant was a period where Homo sapiens and Neanderthals are believed to have coexisted intermittently. Vendramini's theory proposes that this era of predation had a profound evolutionary impact on our species, essentially claiming that the trauma of being hunted forced Homo sapiens into a rapid survival-based transformation. According to this idea, modern human traits such as lighter body frames, faster reflexes, and even psychological tendencies like fearfulness and hypervigilance all evolved in response to the relentless Neanderthal threat. Vendramini even went as far as to attribute behaviours such as pair bonding, hidden ovulation, and deep parental investment to this period of intense survival pressure. So here's the question, was he right? Well, to examine that, we first have to look at how he anatomically viewed the Neanderthals. And trust me, it is absolutely jarring. In order to sell his idea, in his book, Them and Us, Danny Vendramini presented a highly controversial anatomical reconstruction of Neanderthals that was dramatically different from mainstream scientific interpretations. But what did he present? Well, using the La Faracia one skull as a base, Vendramini, along with his visual artist Arturo Barciero, reimagined the Neanderthals not as upright, intelligent hominins, but as strangely ape-like, predator-like beings. 
taking more creative liberty than scientific. His model described them as hunchbacked, quadrupedal, or semi-bipedal, with short limbs, broad torsos, and a thick, muscular build. To put it simply, he suggested they had an anatomy more in line with chimpanzees than homo sapiens. In one of his wilder claims, Vendramini suggested that Neanderthals were covered head to toe in thick fur, and because of this, had little to no need for clothing. This insane idea rejected the conventional view that Neanderthals made and wore tailored garments for cold climates and instead suggested that, like many animals, their fur alone was more than sufficient. This fur and chimpanzee anatomy essentially gave them a beastly appearance that you would normally attribute more to non-human primates or even fictional creatures like werewolves rather than documented hominins. But if you think this was insane, then wait till you hear about the anatomical claims he made involving the Neanderthals' eyes. Taking in real archaeological finds, Vendramini pointed to the large orbital sockets in Neanderthals' skulls and interpreted these as housing enormous forward-facing eyes with, get this, vertical slit pupils, like a cat's that were adapted for nocturnal hunting. Cool factor aside, this speculative interpretation exaggerated the visual impact of the model, making Neanderthals appear menacing, hyper-predatory, and even alien. But the eyes were just one part, as facially, his reconstruction was a completely new direction from standard forensic practices. To push his idea, Vendramini disregarded the well-established tissue depth markers based on both modern humans and closely related primates, arguing instead for a reconstruction built from chimpanzee facial musculature. To accomplish this, he removed the prominent Neanderthal nose, which is at the moment widely accepted as an adaptation for humidifying and warming the cold, dry air of the time. Instead, he replaced it with a flat, recessed nasal region. To tie up his idea, he also added a wide mouth and oversized jaw with a heavy brow ridge. Basically, he focused on the traits that were more commonly associated with apes or Australopithecines. But the face was just the beginning, according to Vendramini. Neanderthals lacked a forehead and had a more sloping, primitive cranium. As such, his model proposed that their skull shape needed a forward-thrust neck and a crouched posture, features which, mind you, are not supported by the majority of skeletal evidence. The result of this was a creature that looked more like a monstrous hybrid of a gorilla and a wolf than a close human relative. Surely he didn't get away with this, right? Well, thankfully, he didn't. As you would expect, Vendramini's reconstruction has been widely debunked by experts in paleoanthropology and forensic facial reconstruction. For one, critics noted that his model is rooted in speculation, cherry-picked features, and artistic license, and not in, well, anatomical science. But that was just the beginning, as Neanderthal postcranial remains, which includes pelvises, vertebrae, and limb bones, clearly show that they were upright bipeds with slightly more robust builds than modern humans, and not the hunched or quadrupedal monster he designed. There's also the fact that their anatomy supports efficient bipedal walking and endurance-based hunting strategies, which completely shatter his four-legged assumptions. To disprove his idea even further, the concept of slit pupils and nocturnal vision is not supported by any known hominin biology or genetics. To make it worse, his claim has no basis, as the shape of the eye socket does not dictate pupil type, and no fossil or genetic evidence indicates Neanderthals had such predator-like visual systems. Even the notion of complete fur covering our ancient cousin was debunked as it conflicts with recent genetic evidence showing that Neanderthals likely had pale skin and even red hair. Essentially, evidence today points more to them using clothing rather than a full-body fur coat. To bring it all together, Vendramini's anatomical claims were not based on any empirical evidence or accepted methodology. While they are admittedly visually dramatic, his reconstructions distort the known facts about Neanderthal anatomy and behavior, presenting a version designed to shock rather than inform but giving him the benefit of the doubt, sure, his anatomical structure was debunked, but what of his predation idea? That cannot be too far-fetched. After all, cannibalism is all over nature in plants, animals, and even humans today. Let's look at the fossils. In the case of the Neanderthal predation theory, the fossil record tells a very interesting story, but to call it simple would be a lie. See, when examined, Upper Paleolithic Homo sapiens remains show trauma, 
something you could assume supports Vendramini's theory. But here's the thing. Interpreting these injuries as signs of predation, especially by Neanderthals, requires a lot of rethinking and caution. Sure, fossils like the Mladic 1 and Sungir reveal healed fractures that suggest individuals survived serious injuries. But to be fair, these wounds are more consistent with interpersonal violence, accidents, or hunting injuries than with systematic attacks you would expect from cannibalistic Neanderthals. But that doesn't mean that Neanderthals and Homo sapiens didn't clash. On the contrary, fossils like the Sansaser 1, which is a Neanderthal found with a healed cranial lesion, shows us that our ancient cousins may have clashed with Homo sapiens. So is this Vendramini's proof? Well, no, because these isolated cases fall short of proving species-wide conflict. And as it stands, no clear, widespread pattern of lethal injuries exists to support the notion of ambush predation. Okay, so they didn't hunt us, but what about cannibalism? Because unlike the rest of Vendramini's ideas, this is a more well-attested but complex topic. When it comes to cannibalism, Neanderthals at sites like Krapina, El Cedron, and Goye were found with bones bearing cut and percussion marks that show signs of defleshing and marrow extraction. These concerning patterns suggest a form of nutritional cannibalism that may be possibly tied to environmental stress, with some scholars even proposing ritual elements. But even here, Vendramini's idea falls short, as the victims were other Neanderthals, not Homo sapiens. Now, here's where things get strange, because Homo sapiens also practiced cannibalism, but largely after Neanderthals disappeared. We know this because evidence found at Goff's cave, such as cut-marked bones and skull cups, and Herxium's mass cannibalism site suggests our ancient ancestors practiced cannibalism for both survival and ritual motives. But to put it simply, there is no evidence of humans consuming Neanderthals, or vice versa. Cannibalism only appears to be an intraspecific phenomenon, shaped by more starvation or cultural practices than predation. Sure, Danny Ventramini's Neanderthal predation hypothesis claims Neanderthals hunted Homo sapiens, citing trauma and cannibalism as evidence. But neither the injury patterns nor cannibalism sites support this. In fact, fossils show survival, not slaughter, and cannibalism remains species-bound. To completely kill the idea, the presence of Neanderthal DNA in 1-2% to of modern Eurasians suggests not fear or flight, but interbreeding and interaction. Not to mention the fact that we have discovery sites with tool sharing and cultural overlap, such as the Chateau Peronian layers, something that would be impossible if either of the species hunted the other. What the fossil record actually shows is a world of hardships plagued with injuries from hunts, possible interpersonal violence and cannibalism under stress. But not a war of extermination. Trauma and cannibalism are real, but not proof of ambush. So with that said, that just leaves one part of the idea to dismantle. Did the Neanderthal shape who we are today? Vendramini's idea in his book Them and Us proposes that our ancestors evolved intelligence, culture, and strategic behavior primarily in response to predation by Neanderthals. Besides portraying Neanderthals as brutal hunters who preyed on early humans in the Levant, he claimed they forced a survival response that shaped Homo sapiens biologically and behaviorally. Essentially, they made us who we are today. His idea argues that the trauma of predation caused rapid cognitive evolution, basically leading to storytelling, symbolic culture, and rituals rooted in fear. In fact, in his idea, language allegedly evolved to coordinate defenses and warn of danger. While strategic behaviors like concealed ovulation and tribal cooperation were, in his view, survival adaptations designed to reduce our vulnerability to attack. Even technology, according to him, came from these primal fears, as he claims. Technological innovation, such as projectile weapons and symbolic art, was a direct response to this existential threat. Now, seeing as we've proved this to not have existed, you could probably already tell that there is no direct archaeological evidence linking Neanderthal predation to the development of human culture or intelligence. In fact, genetic data suggests language and cooperation likely evolved gradually in response to complex social dynamics, not solely due to predator pressure. Neanderthals themselves even showed signs of symbolic behavior and care for group members, making it clear they were not mindless predators. Not to mention traits like concealed ovulation and pair bonding long predate significant human Neanderthal interaction. And although selective pressures can drive innovation and cooperation, Vendramini's claim that fear alone shaped Homo sapiens oversimplifies the interplay of ecological, social, and cognitive factors. 
Basically, while fear and competition may have played a role in shaping human evolution, mainstream science views Homo sapiens intelligence and culture as multifactorial developments and not solely forged by terror of Neanderthals. So let's wrap this up, shall we? American lay psychoanalyst and social historian Lloyd DeMaus once said that history begins with trauma. However, in the case of the Neanderthal predation theory, Vendramini takes these words literally, proposing that early Homo sapiens were shaped by a predatory clash with Neanderthals. To his credit, his narrative is vivid and emotionally charged, but to be honest, it lacks the structural backbone or scientific rigor. He basically just constructed a scenario around speculative behavior, trauma responses, and evolutionary leaps, but relies heavily on circumstantial fossil interpretation and unverified behavioral assumptions, not to mention the sources he references are often secondary, and there is little to no peer-reviewed research that supports his conclusions. In a scientific discourse, a hypothesis is simply a proposed explanation that can be tested through experimentation or observation, while a theory is a comprehensive explanation supported by a significant body of evidence and repeated validation. Seeing as Vendramini's ideas have not been subjected to scientific trials or validated through peer consensus, they have not passed through the mechanisms that elevate hypotheses into theories. To make matters worse, the few academic responses to his work have killed its chance to be anything more, as it is seen as unsubstantiated and speculative. At its purest form, it presents an imaginative interpretation, but not one grounded in verifiable data or evolutionary logic. So with that said, we can confidently say that the Neanderthal predation of Ventramenes is simply speculative fiction, not science, not pseudoscience, just storytelling dressed as theory. So what do you think? Did the Neanderthals hunt our ancestors and launch us into an evolutionary arms race that influenced everything from our primal instincts for survival to our social behaviours? We've been told it's climate change, competition, or even interbreeding that led Neanderthals to extinction. But could the truth be far darker and more violent than we imagined? Was it direct, brutal predation that wiped them out? and in the process sculpted the very humans we are today. Let us know your thoughts in the comments. If you're hungry for more wild theories and deep dives into our ancient past, don't forget to like, subscribe, and hit that bell icon.